Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time coming to you from our homes. Uh, joining me is Shaka Sally himself, aka the Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Dugu Paul. How are you? I remain simple, easy, and as some of my fans have suggested, an awesome son of Africa. Uh, it's a new day, it's a new dawn uh, in Malawi. Uh, maybe perhaps as thanks uh, to uh, the legitimacy of uh, uh, the elections, uh, the independency of the judicial system in Malawi. And here we are, we are talking about uh, a brand new or a totally new president uh, in uh, the Republic of Malawi. Like beauty, it is in the eyes of the beholder when you talk about uh, the type of election that was held. By almost most indications, it was an election indeed that uh, was found to be free, fair, transparent, verifiable, and credible. But guess what? The incumbent president, now the former president of Malawi, a professor Arthur Peter Mutarika, characterized it as perhaps the worst election in Malawian history. He talked about uh, how it was full of rigging and a lot of uh, what some might call creative accounting. That's very interesting because in most cases, uh, the incumbents or the people in power have the means and uh, to control the election. Sometimes they appoint who uh, counts the vote. Uh, why is it that in this particular case, uh, is uh, the person saying that uh, uh, there was a lot of rigging and uh, perhaps uh, maybe it was not a credible election? It is very interesting, Paul, because as a matter of fact, five years earlier, it was the turn of the then incumbent president, Joyce Banda, who had just been beaten by Professor Arthur Peter Mutarika, who actually also came up with more or less the same characterization of that particular election. And yet, as you say, she was an incumbent, and with incumbency comes a lot of advantages, including controlling a lot of institutions that are involved in deciding and determining of holding and winning an election. Uh, what does this say for uh, opposition in Africa? Should this uh, be uh, something that uh, a lot of opposition members uh, can look up to and say that uh, uh, no matter how long you wait, uh, no matter what you do uh, when you're fighting against all odds, one day your turn will come? Because what we've seen in, uh, in Marau is remarkable in a sense that uh, uh, they have waited for over 26 years, waiting waiting, and every other five years they've gone to elections, lost, uh, gracefully uh, walked away, uh, started another cycle, and here we are, we are talking about uh, a new president being sworn in uh, this weekend. I think that um, its history of democracy, I think, has been rather a little bit admirable. Because, let's face it, uh, first of all, it begins with the founding president, the late Dr. Hastings Kamuzu Banda, the man that uh, was characterized as the Wamuyaya, the Nguazi, pretty much uh, a man who had declared himself a life president. And he did. And, I mean, he stayed in power almost to, to his death. <laughs> he did, but uh, what is interesting about it is that uh, back in 1993, there was a constitutional amendment which called for a referendum to give an opportunity to the Malawian people to decide whether they would continue with the same life president who obviously was uh, presiding over what was, at that time, the one-party state, and or whether they could move on to merit party elections. And the Malawian people chose the latter. And in 1994, they went for that Married Party election in which the founding president, Dr. Banda, actually competed and was soundly defeated by Mr. Bakiri Muruzi, who, of course, uh, became the second president of the Republic of Malawi. 
the good thing about that election poll is that this man who had called himself a life president, he actually had the humility, the courtesy, and the grace with which to concede defeat. And in this particular case, you have not had the incumbent president or the former president, Professor Arthur Mutarika, having really the humility, the grace with which to concede defeat and offer his support to the new president, Lazarus Chakwera. Dr. Lazarus Chakwera. Dr. Lazarus Chakwera. And I think you are right, in fact, because uh, Marawians like those salutations very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Shaka, I've uh, had an opportunity to interact uh, with uh, the Malawian uh, president. Uh, in fact, I remember one time uh, I told him, when I told him that I was from Uganda, he joked with me. He said, you know what? Guess what? I taught uh, your president at the University of Dar es Salaam. And I was like, wow, how many years ago that was? He was like, uh, he was a very, very interesting guy. And here we are, we are talking about a, a person who a lot of people have said that uh, 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 under his uh, stewardship or under his leadership, uh, he has not been a bad guy. He has been a great guy. He has uh, tried to obey the same laws. He's a lawyer. He has tried to obey uh, the rules and laws of that uh, uh, country. But here, uh, a lot of people, a lot of skeptics are saying that uh, he's not even willing to concede uh, what happened. For it is true that, in fact, uh, he taught at the then University College Dar es Salaam. He taught law in Tanzania, except that uh, your president, Yoweri Museveni, was not a law student. I think, I think he, they taught him a class because he was very, very confident about it. The way he said it's it. It's quite possible. Yeah, he it's taught him. It's quite possible that uh, yes, yes. Museveni may have done what we normally do here in the United States, and that is auditing. You go into a class so that you monitor what is going on and all that kind of stuff. But the facts will show that Museveni was not a law student. Mm -hmm. He is a man, by the way, who taught in many, many African and American universities hmm. over so many years. He is a man that, uh, interestingly, got the JSD, the, doctor, the Doctorate of Jurisprudence Science, which is the equivalent of the PhD at Yale University. And guess what? You are talking about 1964. Jeez, almost uh, 60 years ago. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yes. So, yes, and the man has told so many people who have gone on to become remarkable lawyers. Others have moved on to become judges in their different countries. But can you believe this is the same man, sincerely, that somehow does not accept a result that is considered to be legit. Now, to the extent that this is a lawyer in his own right, and a professor of law for that matter, receiving the stolen goods, and yet deciding that uh, he was a legitimate president. But this time around, when he actually loses, he doesn't have the guts. He doesn't have the courtesy. He doesn't have the humility to accept the results. Well, you could also argue that uh, uh, he has uh, supporters, uh, he's playing to, to his supporters, but at the end of the day, I think he'll make the right call, he'll make the right move. Uh, he's uh, suddenly, I've come to know the guy as somebody who, uh, who is not greedy, in a sense that I would want to stick around for a very long time. He doesn't really have to hand over power, because uh, that process has already been done. The president-elect Lazarus Chakwera, he is now effectively the new president of the Republic of Malawi. And so it was like during the days when uh, the then president, Joyce Banda, declined to endorse, declined to concede defeat when she was beaten by uh, Professor Arthur Peter Mutarika. She did not endorse him. She did not concede defeat 
but life went on. How do you respond to people who said that uh, uh, this is uh, an end of an era? Uh, you've had uh, two brothers uh, basically <laughs> running that place uh, for a very long time. Uh, they've done some interesting stuff. Uh, when you look at, uh, uh, especially his elder brother, did quite some, uh, a lot of stuff uh, for that country. In fact, to some extent, a lot of people have compared him with uh, uh, the the the, the Yamuya uh, uh, Kamuzu Banda, the one that you Kamuzu referred to. Banda. Yeah, that he did quite a lot, uh, at least for the time he was there. I think as a family, they did something good for themselves. They obviously enter, they now enter the history books as probably the first brothers uh, on the African continent, probably to ever, in fact, grace that office. But when you talk about uh, the history of Malawi, I think it is remarkable because this particular election is, in fact, historic. Mm. Not only for Malawi, but, in fact, for the African continent and the world, for that matter. Right. Mind you, this is an election that came about as a result of the previous one being annulled mm -hmm. by the, coast, the courts of Malawi. That's correct. This is the second time, by the way, in the history of African democracy that you have had a Supreme Court, a Supreme Court annulling an election mm -hmm. that was won by an incumbent. The first one, as you remember, was in the Republic of Kenya. Correct. You remember we were in Zanzibar, the island of yes, Zanzibar. Yes, yes. When that happened. But unlike, for example, the election that was annulled in Kenya, uh -huh. which was, which obviously, uh, which provided an opportunity to have a second, a fresh election, uh, that election, you, as you will recall, uh -huh. was boycotted by the opposition led by Raira Amoro Odinga. That's correct. So Uhuru Kenyatta ended up, in fact, running against himself. And part of the reason, frankly, was, yes, the Supreme Court had annulled the election, but had pretty much done nothing uh -huh. about the Electoral Commission. Uh -huh. The same commission that had stolen and messed up the election uh -huh. was left intact. And nobody charged of anything. Uh -huh. And therefore, it was going to remain business as usual. Uh -huh. But in this particular case, in Malawi, it is the first time that not only do you have the court systems annulling the election, That's correct. but also changing the membership of the Electoral Commission. Uh -huh. And that election being won by the leader of the opposition. Lazarus Chakwera, a man who heads the Malawian founding party, uh -huh. the Malawian essentially independence party, the Malawi Congress party, uh -huh. winning, beating the incumbent, and becoming the new president of the Republic of Malawi. And the other thing is, my brother, that uh, this is perhaps one of those few times sincerely that an incumbent on the African soil uh -huh. has lost in a runoff election. Right. The first one was, I remember, in Senegal in 2012, uh -huh. when you had uh, Marky Sall, you know, who was the leader of an opposition, uh -huh. beating the then incumbent president, uh -huh. Abdul Wad. Uh -huh. Yes, so this is the second time, I think, it has happened on the African continent. Let's speak to uh, the legitimacy of uh, the process. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it would not have been a fair and transparent process uh, if the process in itself was not uh, transparent. Uh, right from the courts uh, taking a stand saying that no, uh, anything that could have gone wrong went wrong. So this election is now and void. Uh, they try to appeal it, but uh, the court stood by that decision, and uh, they went ahead and uh, pushed 
the country to go for a fresh elections. Uh, let's talk about that process. What does that mean for uh, for Africa? What does that mean for uh, countries uh, where the judiciary is, uh, in a way, fused with uh, the ruling parties? First of all, uh, you are you have a point in the sense that uh, when you look at Malawi, Malawi is Malawi is probably uh, one of those few exceptions mm. on the African continent where you have these three equal branches of government. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the executive, which is led by a president. You're talking about uh, the judiciary, which is led by the chief justice. And you are talking about uh, the National Assembly, which is led by a speaker. Mm -hmm. But these three core equal branches of government mm. are fiercely independent of one another, even though they supplement and complement by working together mm. to advance democracy in the Republic of Malawi. Mm -hmm. This is, in fact, what needs to happen in most African countries. Right. If you are going to have a democracy that is flourishing, if you are going to have an election whose results are going to be a reflection of the will of the people who voted, whose results are going to be the will of the people and not the will of the individuals who count the votes mm -hmm. or the individual who finally announces the result. And that really bodes well for peace and stability in Malawi. Malawi has a lot of challenges. When you look at uh, uh, the region, uh, Malawi is arguably one of uh, those uh, countries that uh, is considered quote-unquote uh, by World Bank and all these other institutions as a very poor country. So that means he has a lot of uh, challenges as we move forward. So how is he going to tackle those uh, challenges and what does he really bring to the table? How is he different from uh, his predecessor? I think that uh, looking at his statement, looking at the manner in which he addressed the Malawian people, he seems to be a man of the people. He seems to be a man of God. After all, he was in the ministry. He has served as a member of parliament for his constituency. Uh -huh. He has also been largely in the ministry. He's a very religious individual and religious leader. In fact, a religious leader of international repute. He has said, which is very interesting, that uh, he looks forward to becoming a servant leader, uh -huh. meaning that uh, his bosses, while he may be the boss of those who work under the government of the Republic of Malawi, he actually will be having the bosses who are the Malawian people, uh -huh. the basically the primary stakeholders. They are the people who have hired him by voting him and giving him an opportunity to be the president. Uh -huh. And so I think that uh, we should look at someone that is obviously going to come up with some kind of uh, creativity, innovativeness, and imagination. Someone that is going to listen to his people very, very closely. Somebody that is going to consult his people, his cabinet. Somebody, is going to, somebody that is going to work very closely with his vice president. A vice president who actually has really been in that position for a very long time. There are some people who are wondering whether He's headed for being a permanent and pensionable vice president. Mm. But you know, Soros Shirima is still a very young man, and he basically, one of these days, could get the opportunity to become, in his own right, the Malawian head of state at some point. Let's go to uh, Kowandani Chamfanda. Uh, on Chilima, the person that you're talking about, uh, he says that uh, Chilima, being uh, the Minister of Economic Planning and Development and Public Reforms, is a good choice. Uh, the guy is an economist by profession and has demonstrated that, that he can perform 
uh, at such important positions. But uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. How is he going to be different from the people who came before him? I think we should give them the benefit of the doubt. I think we should uh, give them the freedom to be able to do their thing so that later then we can be in a position to assess them correctly. I have no doubt that uh, these people are committed to making a difference. Because if they didn't, if they were not in a position to make a difference, they probably wouldn't be looking for those types of positions. They have looked for those types of positions not because they are people who could not survive without holding that office. These are individuals who have demonstrated the capacity to deliver at the different levels. And I think that uh, it may be a challenge, but probably they are up to that challenge. Let's be patient, give them the benefit of the doubt, and see whether or not they are going to deliver. Let's go to uh, talking evidence in Nyarinda. Uh, now we have uh, new leaders uh, in Malawi. We have uh, uh, arguably a greater combination of leaders, the vice president and the president. These are remarkable people. But how are they going to deal with the daily day-to-day -day challenges? Uh, uh, first, we have COVID, and then we have other things that have beaten Malawi for a very long time. How are they going to deal with those challenges? The last time I checked, it seems to me that... Uh... Dr. Lazarus Chakwera got more than 65%. So that surely is a mandate, especially running against a strong incumbent president. So I think that uh, we should look, for example, at their political manifesto. We should look at uh, some of the things that uh, they have promised they are people that they are going to do. And again, give them the benefit of the doubt so that they can deliver. They have just come into office, really. I think we should give them the benefit of the doubt and then start in, perhaps start asking questions, you know, like three years down the line. Because they just won the election. They are going to start, you know, whatever... They are going to start uh, uh, their jobs, uh, you know, and uh, they will need, for example, uh, to be showed the ropes around here and there. One hopes, of course, that uh, the former president, Professor Arthur Peter Mutarika, and his group will be in a position to help them transition into their roles. Uh, Shaka, there is a comment here from uh, James. Uh, uh, James says that, uh, uh, Shaka, you've had an opportunity to cover so many elections on uh, the African uh, continent. Uh, where do you press this election in the African context? How does history look at uh, this uh, election, Shaka? Thank you very much for that very interesting question, James. I sincerely think and I'm saying this from the deepest, better part of the bottom of my Kavari heart and soul, that the rest of Africa should take a cue from the election that just happened in Malawi. We should take a cue from the elections that happened in the Republic of South Africa. We should take a cue from the elections that happened in the Republic of Ghana. These are some of the few African countries, sincerely, that are on the path of democracy. These are, few, these are some of the few countries that, in fact, organize and conduct what is called elections, meaning these elections are organized in a manner that allows every participant to get an opportunity, for example, to interact with the audience and sell their message. 
And when they cast a vote, they cast a ballot, that ballot counts. The results reflect that. And I'm talking about this particular round of elections. And we came here, obviously, because the first election last year, which was annulled by the courts of the Republic of Malawi, was not an election. It was an election whose results did not reflect the will of the voters, the will of the people. It was an election, rather, that was a result of creative accounting, which was done by the Electoral Commission on behalf of the then incumbent president, uh, Professor Arthur Peter Mutarika. Let's go to our final commenter for the day. Uh, let's go to Emmanuel Philly. He says, uh, Shaka, uh, there are some countries uh, that uh, are planning to have electronic elections. You are probably aware of a country that has fronted the idea of having an electronic election. How is that even remotely possible? First of all, uh, electronic elections are very easily possible, especially if they can, in fact, be conducted in good faith. But I think you're probably talking about uh, campaigning, campaigning essentially via the media, campaigning via television, campaigning via radio, campaigning via Facebook. I think that is fine, but it is only fine so long as the playing field is leveled. But, but how can it be leveled when opposition leaders appear on radio stations, they are shut down uh, or they are denied, the, even when they have paid for airtime, they are not even allowed. So here we are on top of denying them access to some of these uh, 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 media outlets. They have a tax, for example, uh, for people who use social media. Uh, they've taxed that. So how are people going to campaign in this particular uh, election? We know, for example, that uh, when it comes to a country like the Republic of Uganda, there is no question that uh, there was what you would call a media liberalization. There is no question that uh, you have what you would call private commercial media, as reflected in the number of radio stations, as reflected in the number of television stations. But what a lot of people do not know is that a lot of these radio stations, a lot of these television stations, yes, they are owned by individuals. But in fact, these are the same individual that are either part of the government or those who support the government. The information that is available to me and my colleagues who do a lot of work on reporting on Uganda, on reporting on elections, that in some cases, opposition members pay for appearing on certain radio platforms, on certain television platforms, and when it is time for them to actually go and be hosted, they are basically denied access because they are told that they have instructions from court and court above. I think that we can only conduct a free, fair, transparent, verifiable, and credible election via the media if and when that media is available to every person, every party, every interest group that has a stake in the affairs of the Republic of Uganda. Thank you so much uh, for being a great guest. I look forward to hosting you on another edition of uh, Shaka Extra Time. Thank you very much, Ndugupor.